Okay, now that we've had a chance to state the divergence theorem and practice using it a little bit, I want to use it to see if we can understand what it tells us about what divergence means. Okay. Because the divergence theorem tells me that this triple integral of the divergence of a vector field f is equal to this double integral, which I know is equal to the flux. So I've just written it over here. This gives me flux. So if I know what I get when I integrate it, that should help me to figure out what does it mean? Because I want to remember, if my integrand, if the divergence of f were constant, then integrating with respect to volume could be replaced with just multiplying by the volume. Integration is what we do anytime we have a formula for something where if I took this thing and it, if it was constant and I multiplied it by the volume for a triple integral, it would give me this result. If that thing isn't constant, we replace just straightforward multiplication with integration. So with a very simple integral, you know, if I'm just integrating from a to b, f of x dx, I'm thinking of this as a height function. If height is constant, I would multiply height times base to get area of a rectangle. Well, if the height isn't constant, I replace that multiplication with integration, but I'm calculating a signed area still. And very often, of course, that area is just a metaphor for something like displacement or work or something else where, again, if I had two constant quantities, I would just multiply them. So anytime I want to understand what an integrand means, I can say, well, if it were constant, then whatever it means, I would multiply it by what's represented by this, which is the volume to get flux. So whatever the divergence means, it should be flux divided by volume, which would just be flux density. So if I think of flux as if we think in terms of fluid flow, it was the mass per unit of time that was flowing through a surface. Well, if I had one kilogram per unit of time flowing through some surface that was the boundary of something, like the surface of the Earth, one kilogram of mass flowing through the surface of the Earth is minuscule because the volume of the enclosed solid, the volume of the Earth, is huge. Okay? On the other hand, if I had one kilogram per second flowing through a sphere like so, that's actually a kind of significant amount of stuff flowing through this surface. And I get that because the enclosed volume is so much smaller than the volume of the Earth. So this sort of puts it into perspective is that amount of stuff flowing through a surface a big deal or not? How does it compare to the enclosed volume? Okay. So, I can think of divergence as being flux density. And in fact, there are two ways that I can define what, flux, what divergence of F is. We've seen one. Divergence of F is del dotted with f. So if my vector field f had as its component functions f of xyz, g of xyz, h of xyz, this is sort of what I call the plug and chug definition. This tells me how to calculate it. This would just be the partial of f with respect to x plus the partial of g with respect to y. That's a g plus the partial of h with respect to z. Fantastic for wanting to know how to calculate it. Tells me exactly what to do. Fairly meaningless for understanding what it means. So there's also the physical definition of divergence of f. If I were to take b sub a to equal a ball of radius a, Remember, the term ball is used just to mean the solid sphere. So this is a three-dimensional sphere that has some volume. I'm going to take S sub A to be its boundary surface. 
and we'll orient it out. Okay. And I could then calculate, if I wanted to calculate the flux of F across S sub A, I could do that by saying it's the double integral along S sub A of F dotted with N dS. If I wanted to calculate the flux density, I would divide that by the volume of the enclosed solid, which would be the volume of that ball. This would be the double integral along S sub A of F dotted with N dS divided by 4 thirds pi times A cubed, because that's the formula for the volume of a sphere. This would be the flux density over a sphere of radius A. And let's suppose that it's centered at a point P naught. Okay. So I've got this lovely sphere. It's centered at the point P naught. This would actually define a family of spheres all centered at that point. And this would give me the flux density across the surface of that sphere. Now, what I can do if I want to really focus in on what's happening at that point, the smaller I make A, the smaller I make that ball, the smaller I make that surface, I could then calculate the flux density across that. I can actually define then that the divergence of F at P naught, because remember this is a function which I could evaluate at various points. So I could evaluate this at the point P naught, but I can also define the divergence of F at P naught to be the limit as A approaches zero, so as I shrink this ball down to just a single point of the double integral along S sub A of F dotted with N dS, that's the flux across the boundary surface, divided by the volume, which would be 4 thirds pi times A cubed. Now obviously A can't be zero, because if A is zero, we're talking about just the single point P naught. It doesn't have a boundary surface because it's just a single point, so I couldn't calculate the flux over this non-existent boundary surface. And the volume of a single point is zero because that would be a degenerate ball of zero volume. But if I take the limit of this thing, it turns out that gives me the divergence of F at P naught. And of course, I could use this definition and just evaluate it at P naught as well. I would simply take this function and evaluate it there. Okay. So this definition tells me how to calculate the divergence. This definition tells me what it means. It is not at all obvious that the two definitions are equal. Okay. I'm going to just to make it clear, because right now I've got this written as a function, but the divergence of f at p naught would be del dotted with f evaluated at p naught, which would be this evaluated at p naught. Okay. So now they're both talking about the divergence at a point. It is not at all obvious that this is the same as this. They are. Now, on an exam, I could ask you, what is the definition of divergence? If that's all I say, there are two correct answers. You could give me this, or you could give me this. And you could also just give it to me in words as flux density, because that's what this represents. So you could give me flux density either, either as a verbal description or by giving me the formula for it. Okay. What I might do is say, give me the definition of divergence of F at a point two ways. One the plug and chug how you calculate it definition, and two, the definition that gives me the physical interpretation of what it means. Okay, So this would be the plug and chug how you calculate it, this or this, either a verbal description or the formula, and I would accept either there, would give me the physical description of what it actually means. 
And it's basically just putting that flux in perspective. If this much stuff is flowing through, there's a big difference between it flowing through a sphere of this size and a sphere whose size is the, the, um, the size of the Earth. The same amount of flux over those surfaces is very, very different in terms of flux density. So it just puts things into perspective to tell me what's going on and how big a deal is that relative to the size of the surface that's enclosed. Okay, now like I said, it's not at all obvious that these two things are equal. Your textbook does present a, a proof of the divergence theorem. I'm not gonna choose to go through that. What I am gonna do is I'm gonna strongly recommend a book called Div Grad Curl and all that. Great name. It's by H.M. Shea, is the author. Um, those should all be capital letters, but on my version of the book, it's all written in lowercase. That's a style thing, I guess. Okay. Uh, in this book, the authors of that book go through an informal explanation of why these two definitions of divergence are equivalent. What I'm going to do in the next video is rather than actually proving the divergence theorem, because I think it's an interesting proof, but I don't think it's an enlightening proof in that after working through it, you're like, ah, oh, yes, I see why these things are the same. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work through the informal argument presented in this book uh, about why these two definitions of divergence are the same. It's an informal argument rather than a formal proof, because we approximate things. And any time you approximate, there's no guarantee that when you take the limit, you're going to get the right thing. So this is going to use an approximation to suggest that we get the right thing. Okay, But working through that argument, I think, is an enlightening argument because it really does help to explain why these two things are actually the same and gives us a much better understanding of what divergence actually is and what it actually means in the physical world. Okay, so that's where we'll pick up in the next video.